Welcome back to the channel, guys. I've got a special guest on today. We've got Daniel from Invictus. So it's the CEO. And we're looking at Invictus again today because we want to get an update after the quarterly reports and seeing how this is comparing to Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency space. Uh, just before I cross over to Daniel, I'll just ask you if you're interested in more of the cryptocurrency content, understanding it from this point of view, let us know, hit the subscribe, like the content up and bell notification icon. So Dan, thanks again for joining us on the channel. Talk a little bit more about Invictus and the crypto index funds that you've got there. Um, yeah, just a little intro about yourself in case guys haven't seen or heard of you before. Invictus Capital yourself, when you started, why? Sure. So we, we launched in 2017, um, providing a low cost index fund option, Crypto20. Um, essentially, what this means is that you can hold 20 cryptocurrencies you know, within a single token. Um, it rebalances weekly. It's got an asset cap um, of 10% per token. So there's no, you know, the fund isn't exposed to any singular assets risks. And um, it's shown remarkable performance over the, the past quarter, um, even compared to Bitcoin. Uh, we'll have a look at those in just a sec. Uh, in terms of starting the fund, just a quick why, like, you know, 2017, why did you decide to start a fund? We looked at what existed in the traditional financial markets and um, what was lacking in crypto. And, you know, beyond just buying Bitcoin or just buying ETH, if somebody wants exposure to a broad range of assets, um, obviously, you know, when you're dealing with a singular asset like Bitcoin or with Ethereum, you know, there's a, a multitude of risks that come with that um, in terms of, you know, some particular ecosystem, uh, you know, hack or something going wrong or some government, you know, taking a dislike to a particular cryptocurrency. Um, it is generally safer, I mean, in the traditional sense to have a portfolio of assets, although they all rather correlated um, in the crypto markets, whereas traditionally the aim would be to build a portfolio of uncorrelated assets. These are, this is slowly starting to change as you can you know, see lately, uh, some of the cryptos aren't moving exactly in step anymore as they always used to be. Um, so that's very promising in terms of diversification. But ultimately, what we wanted to do was provide an option for people who didn't know, you know, which particular cryptocurrency they were interested in, who didn't feel like, you know, spending 100 hours of research on going through every single coin in the top 20 to identify, you know, which they feel has potential. Um, and to just choose one, you know, the index fund strategy has outperformed active management in the traditional markets, um, you know, for the past couple of decades. And it has a much lower expense ratio than, you know, an actively managed fund. So in terms of traders, if, you know, an individual likes to trade, uh, there's the old saying that 90% of retail traders lose 90% of their holdings in 90 days, um, which is broadly true if you look at, you know, the public results that companies like Plus500, eToro, et cetera, publish. Um, and you know, we wanted to create a non-predatory, easy option for people to get into cryptocurrency, not have to worry about, you know, which coin to pick because the top 20 will always be the top 20 by market cap, whether a coin falls out of favor or not. Once a week, the fund is rebalanced, the new coins enter the fund, um, and it's, you know, pretty much a done for you system. You just hold the C20. Easy. And that pretty much explains yeah, pretty what much gap you're trying to fill in the market there. It's basically helping retail to not have to worry about picking a whole different bunch of coins and just finding one index fund that can, uh, in this case, for this quarter, is outperforming the market in general. Yeah, so we've had a brilliant a brilliant quarter. I mean, um, it seems that the alternative coins, altcoins, uh, Ethereum, et cetera, um, have been doing really well. Uh, there's been a solid uptick in performance um, in Q4 of last year. Uh, Bitcoin was, you know, the rising star, um, and just before that was DeFi summer of this September. Mm -hmm. But now it seems even some of those DeFi coins have made it into the top twenty. For example, um, you know, you can check it out. It's pretty interesting, um, and very glad that you know some of those original L1 chains of the 2017 era that no one's really using is, you know, starting to fall out, and, and coins with a valid use case and growth market are actually rising up. Do you have some of the results there for, let's just look at like yeah, the Bitcoin, sure. the, the C10, which is a crypto 10 and this crypto 20. Did you want to have a look at those or just one in particular? 
C20 was our original index fund. It's got about $80 million under management at the moment. And the performance for the past quarter, Q1 was around 222%, uh, whereas the same for Bitcoin was 103% in Q1. So significantly outperformed um, Bitcoin in, in Q1. And that's primarily as a result of the outperformance of uh, all the alts. Um, you know, for example, one, one interesting use case for, you know, an index fund might be something, you know, like Doge, which I personally wouldn't have bought or held, but as it was rising up through the ranks of C20, as it is an index fund, you know, it doesn't make active decisions. Um, you know, it follows a passive investment strategy, which avoids all the emotion traditionally attached to investing. And you know, the fund obviously buys into the asset as it rises up through the ranks. Um, and as it exceeds the 10% cap, every week it's rebalanced and the gains from that cryptocurrency, um, if you know it has outperformed the rest of the market, are diversified across all the other assets. So it's not like something just rises, pumps into the, the fund and disappears. Um, you know, those gains will be spread out across the, the other assets if it exceeds that 10% asset cap. It did really well for the fund, and that's been a, a star performer, particularly this quarter now so far in April. And the Q, uh, the C20 also oh. outperformed Ethereum as well, from what I remember looking in terms of, yeah, the return for Ethereum just quarter one. That's our star initial fund, uh, the one that we approached the market with. Subsequently, we've launched a bunch of other funds in different asset classes. So we don't only have cryptocurrency, we have solar fund, we've got gold, um, we've got a hedged fund. So it's similar to C20, except we scale uh, algorithmically in and out of cash once a week, uh, depending on market conditions. And that's the C10 fund. So C C10's had an average cash position since inception of around 50%. So around half the time, it's been completely in cash. If you check out the quarterly report, I mean, there's basically a flat line over a lot of, you know, 2019, uh, when the market was taking a nosedive. So mm -hmm. we sent investors massive drawdown there. We launched the fund at a dollar. It's never been below uh, one dollar. It's trading around seven. Seven dollars at the moment. So the aim of the C10 fund is to provide investors basically with peace of mind. It's not like you know a lot of the people who've been through 2017 know the experience of you know uh, buying into crypto. You know, seeing your net worth rise massively on on paper. Um, yeah. And yeah. Discovering three months later that uh, it isn't so. So. We wanted to remove that kind of stress from people's lives um, in terms of, you know, having to check your portfolio 50 times a day, having to decide, you know, should I sell, should I hold, should I buy back now uh, or not? And um, it has been massively successful in that regard. It's got significantly lower drawdown um, than Bitcoin. And it has been also a stellar performer that actually outperformed Bitcoin over the past quarter as well. And just to explain drawdown, if we've got some new retail investors there, drawdown is basically from the highest point to the drop, to the, 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 the trough before it takes off again. And I can vouch for that, you know, on the channel, when there's a drop in Bitcoin of 20%, you know, people lose their minds, they lose their minds over 15%. And the idea here is that it's a smaller drawdown. And that's the whole point of the fund rebalancing between the cryptos and the stable coins or, or fiat. So, so cryptocurrency is very pronounced um, market cycles. So the bullish cycles are, you know, as you can see over the past quarter or two, very bullish, and the bear cycles are similarly bearish. And it lasts for quite a while, um, even though, you know, on a micro scale, you know, you can view it on, you know, an hourly chart or something, and you can see, you know, some price increases, decreases, etc. But if you zoom out and sort of a daily or weekly chart you can see you know, these trends very clearly. So rebalancing on a weekly basis into and out of cash, basically near the top of the trend, as the market starts declining, the C10 will scale more and more into cash. And as the market starts rising again, it'll buy back into crypto um, and eventually return to its 100% in cash position. You can see 
um, the live performance since inception in March 2019. So this is all available on our website. You can actually see um, when it went into cash, its holdings at any point in time, um, and verify for yourself, along with you know our huge community on Discord, um, you know that it has actually been successful. For example, I'll leave um, a link to this in the description as well, so they can click across to see the the reports. Uh, you know, C10, C20, Bitcoin. One one star result uh, for us was that the C10 fund during the you know extreme crash um, during March um, of 2020, uh, C10 was 100% in cash on that day. So it was a pretty good pretty good result for the fund and uh, let a lot of people sleep. A lot uh, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people lost their minds and obviously their crypto on that day. That was basically the COVID crash if people are wondering what March 2020 was, but yeah, everything fell out of bed. I think Bitcoin went from about eight or 9,000 down to 3,800, 3,850. So I was, I was watching it. Yeah. <laughs> I was watching it fall through the floor. Um, yeah, that was, it, was a while, it was a wild time. Definitely. I didn't think it would reach there that far, but I had a couple of indicators on there. I'm like, this thing, it's weird. It could fall to this point, but it just went there so quick, scared a lot of people out. Um, the craziest part about, you know, derivatives exchanges like um, using something like BitMEX is that, you know, those prices are tracking, you know, was tracking around $500 or $1,000 below spot. So even if you would have survived, you know, holding spot like an index fund would, um, at those prices, you would have been liquidated in BitMEX just because you know the, the wicks on the uh, futures sure. contracts often extend much further. So it, it's pretty risky, even if you're holding a, a 1x position. Um, well, I mean, a thousand dollars then was 25 to 33 percent of the of the value, whereas a thousand bucks now is obviously not that much. But yeah, that's it's huge. Yeah, barely barely two percent. It sometimes confuses me. <laughs> It's like, wow, it's up a thousand dollars today, and it's not ten percent anymore. I know I used to be trading a few hundred bucks a day, max, or you know, 150 a day. You're like, oh, yeah, decent. In terms of this quarter, what's been some of the big recent developments, uh, big achievements apart from the caps? Anything else in terms of the business? Yeah, so we've launched um, our iCap token, which is essentially a reward token that you can stake any of our funds to earn. Um, so you're not just, you know, holding an index fund, for example, like C10 or C20, you can stake that and earn ICAP. We take a percentage of our management fees, uh, performance fees on, across all of our funds. At the moment, uh, we reached the $100 million uh, AUM milestone. Um, and Congrats. as these milestones Congrats. increase over time, we'll allocate more capital uh, every week to buying and burning ICAP. So that's a brilliant way to take part, you know, in the success of uh, Invictus. And it's something that, for example, some of our funds like our venture capital fund Hyperion, over 60% of the token holders have staked and it's generally for, for a period of one year. So uh, we have a lot of guys that are very, very bullish on the long-term prospects of our funds. Let me know a little bit more about ICAP. You just mentioned you can buy it, you can stake it to earn rewards, you take a management fee from that. Why would I buy ICAP if I need to go and buy C20 or C10? Yeah, you can stake. So you can stake those funds and you can earn ICAP. So it's basically our reward uh, for loyalty um, by committing to staking for like a period of a month, three months, six months or a year um, or any duration that you know, the investor chooses. Essentially, what that allows us to do is have much more effective management of the fund's underlying assets. Uh, for example, we earn extra yield by lending um, some of the assets in C20 out uh, on exchanges like Bitfinex, for example, for margin lending. Um, so that gen generally generates more than uh, the annual management uh, fee on C20. So this quarter, I think we earned the same as um, our entire annual management fee for the uh, lending activities we do with C20. And it allows us to manage that much more effectively since we know how much cash we have to keep on hand to process all the withdrawals, redemptions, et cetera. Um, obviously, if that's locked up for a longer period of time, then you know we can much more efficiently optimize those, those lending algorithms. So the ICAP token itself is you know, a reward token that we provide. 
Um, it's accrued every 30 minutes once you start staking your token. You can withdraw it and sell it at any time. Um, and the value behind the ICAP token is a portion of our entire company's you know, management and performance fee revenue um, on the funds that we take and we buy and burn off the open market. Um, we have an incentive to run a large liquidity pool on Uniswap. So if you provide ICAP ETH liquidity, um, there is a fee incentive that we pay into that pool every day on Uniswap. And we buy and burn those tokens off the market every day. So there's proof of that available on the ICAP page. You can actually see the transactions where you know we put ETH and we buy the ICAP and we burn it once a week. It's very similar to how BNB and FTT tokens work, for example. I buy C20, Crypto Fund 20, because I don't want to stuff around with all of the different cryptocurrencies. Now, with that, I can stake it in your, in your platform. And mm -hmm. the benefit to that for you guys is that then you can lend that out so you know how much is there. And then you're lending that to make a return. And for making that return, you pay me a little bit back in uh, ICAP tokens, which also have a value and a deflationary. Did I get mm -hmm. that right? So that, it's disinflationary, yes. Um, so that, that return goes to the fund as well. I mean, the lending, the lending returns um, and obviously good fund performance uh, you know attracts more investors so it's really in our best interest to make sure that you know the funds do do as well as possible at the moment i mean you're essentially paid to own c20 because the lending earns more than the annual management fees um, so it's essentially free to hold those funds if you were holding those same cryptocurrencies it would be more expensive than buying into uh, the c20 fund um, beyond that, you know, some of the other benefits of you know, having a fund, obviously, um, as a fund of some size, if you have $80 million, $100 million under management, um, you can get very competitive fee discounts and exchanges, um, offer zero rated fees or rebates uh, if you're using limit orders. So that's something that can add up quite a bit if you're doing weekly rebalancing. There's quite a few benefits in terms of dealing with exchanges if, if you have a, a large asset pool. It's basically a full-time job to rebalance a fund like that. Or if you were an individual investor to calculate the weightings once a week and do all the trading, mm. it's a minor nightmare. So it really is much more convenient to, to have a fund option. Yeah, and on top of that, I was thinking about the taxes if you're buying and selling all the time. Whereas in this case, you buy the one token and it's all done for you. So all the buying and the selling is taken care of. I don't have to go through a whole tax return and just buy the C20, let it sit. So it could also, it could also be a, a good retirement fund option, which is I think what I talked about in the previous video when I understood that, I could put it in my self-managed super fund and I don't have to do anything. I just buy the C20 and let it let it do its thing. You guys are doing all the rebalancing. So we've got a, a margin lending fund as well. So basically what that does is accrues interest from lending US dollars. So not all of our funds are um, cryptocurrency you know, denominated. The margin lending fund earns interest from lending out those assets, which compounds within itself. So it's similar to you know something like uh, Nexo or Celsius offers except that it's much more tax efficient in that the compounding and the interest earned is with, within the token structure. So it's not like you're being paid interest and you have to pay tax on that interest every week or month or whenever Celsius allocates that to you. It's within the token and you can pay capital gains. I mean, obviously um, not a tax attorney in every country on the planet. So uh, please consult with you know, your local practitioner, but um, it is generally uh, for many countries more efficient to have that happen to earn interest inside a token inside a fund um, and then pay capital gains at the end when you convert back to fiat currency so the interest earned so is the icap token the we have an iml fund so that's that's one of them um but the staking accrues icap you know you can stake any of our funds for icap i was just trying to think of if i held the c20 and this, you know, there's Cardano in there or Polkadot with, that are earning some staking rewards that accrues within the C20 token that I own. Yes. Yes. yes All right, cool. Helps. I'm not yes, getting that, like that little helps. bits of DOT, little bits of ADA, and then I have to pay yeah. tax on those. It's so much easier. The, the fund handles all of that and 100% of the um, asset staking, if you're staking, you know, DOT or I mean, previously we had Dash nodes and, and all of that kind of thing, um, that all goes to the fund. Uh, and then you guys sort out the tax in whatever jurisdiction 
Invictus is formed in? Are they formed yes. in South Africa so or are you in a different in, uh, we're jurisdiction? Based, uh, we're based in the Cayman Islands. I mean, our, our head office in terms of uh, where most of the employees are based is in, in Cape Town in South Africa. Yeah. Um, and we're, yeah. This quarter, we're going, one of the major sort of exciting things that we're going through at the moment is, you know, the full regulatory process. So we, we will be um, essentially the same as any other mutual fund provider, uh, except existing on the blockchain. And we may just be the first company globally um, that actually has their fund share register on the blockchain. So we're really excited about that and looking forward to, to getting that sorted out by end of end of this quarter. That's cool. Yeah, so that's 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 really exciting for us. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, and I believe it will, you know, be a big change uh, for the industry in general um, versus a lot of the other, you know, sort of unregulated providers. We want to give people peace of mind about you know, where they're holding uh, their assets. And are there other competitors in the space that, you know, you've got to get there first and you have the big, you've got the name in terms of the crypto hedge fund in the industry? Uh, in terms of, of competitors, there are some in the DeFi space. Um, you can look at something like DHedge, I guess. They aren't an asset manager themselves, but they provide a protocol where other people can launch funds on. Um, I mean, in my experience, I have tried it out. It's really expensive to, to invest in a pool, sometimes upwards of $500. That makes it largely unfeasible for most people. I mean, the, there's also extreme limitation as to what you can hold in those as an asset manager as well. You know, what you're trading out there in terms of a centralized parties, you know, counterparty risk in the DeFi sense is, is technological risk. And, you know, there have been countless um, protocol acts of the past yeah. quarter or two, um, which might result in, you know, loss of uh, the entirety of your fund. So I would, you know, caution against, um, you know, taking too, too much of your capital to a single thing, particularly if it hasn't been around for very long. Um, yeah. Our smart yeah. contracts basically handle our redemptions automatically, redemptions and investments. So not, no withdrawals ever have to be approved by a human when you're using our fund platform. Um, and that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can process a withdrawal. And um, depending on which fund, so for example, C20 and C10 are once every hour, uh, the redemptions are processed um, and you will receive uh, Ethereum back into your wallet. Well, it sounds pretty straightforward. Looking at institutions now, I mean, you're being in that space, do you have any information that the general public wouldn't see or hear of in terms of family offices coming in, wanting to buy bigger portions of a, a C20 token or anything in general that they're looking to you guys? What we're launching in the US at the moment, we're, we're um, basically, I've just completed um, the setup process for the C10 edged fund uh, in, in, the, in the traditional structure um, and we've seen a lot of interest in that from traditional investors what they're looking for is essentially uh, bitcoin exposure cryptocurrency exposure but they do not want um, the sort of extreme drawdown that comes with that so you know there's a variety of ways um, to tackle that problem like using an option strategy color option strategy where you limit upside and downside um, sort of a trade-off, or you can use you know, algorithmic cash hedge, for example. But that seems to be where institutions are, are looking towards. Um, and you know, obviously, they need a very traditional structure uh, to be able to to hold these assets. It's not something that they can very easily hold on their books. Um, yeah. So if, if you're looking towards institutional adoption to buy you know your coin that's ranked 150 on, on coin market cap it's pretty unlikely for now <laughs> it's mostly retail guys that are going to buy it um, however ETH and Bitcoin um, seem to have found a way uh, in terms of the traditional sense of custody uh, between banks to have sort of enough mainstream adoption um, to be held individually as assets Sure, sure. Uh, so in terms of that side of things, it sounds like institutions are here, like everyone gets that. You kind of hear it over and over again, but it's 
few and far between that we actually get to speak with people who are dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And by the sounds of it, pretty much Bitcoin, Ethereum have found their place, like you just said. They're the two main players in that game. I just wanted to cross to like diversification. We touched on it earlier and looking at cryptos which aren't moving together. You know, before it used to be, you know, Bitcoin goes up, everything goes up. Bitcoin goes down, everything goes down. Now we're starting to get some uh, diversification in well, things that aren't correlated anymore. What sort of cryptos are you finding in in that space that aren't correlated? Like not correlated anymore to Bitcoin. You can, see, you can see quite clear divergence when you look at, uh, for example, something um, like privacy coins, or you look at it generally by sector. So something like a, a privacy coin sector is very dependent on you know the global macroeconomic environment and government regulation. And the, the more governments crack down on, on tax and Bitcoin, um, you can see that you know when that happens, the value of the privacy coins go up uh, relative to to Bitcoin and everything else. Uh, star performers over the past few quarters have been exchange coins, um, primarily because of the boom in cryptocurrency. Those uh, coins like FTT, um, BNB, for example, have direct links to those companies' revenue, where they're buying and burning tokens off the market. So the su success of those platforms. Um, is translated to, to the currency. And it's not just speculation value anymore. It's a direct uh, line of revenue. Um, same with a lot of the DeFi coins like Sushi, for example. Aave. They have different you know, sort of performance um, characteristics, primarily because of that link to uh, the creation of value uh, beyond just you know, speculative value, like uh, some of the layer one chains, which are Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. It's primarily based on adoption and how, how many people are using the platform and in terms of the fees generated, et cetera, and uh, how incentivized people are to use those. And that's um, what's creating the divergence in the sectors. Yeah, so if you look at, I mean, it's, it's the links to the value that's actually being produced. Um, whereas, you know, in the 2017 kind of economic environment where people launched ICOs, a lot of the times, you know, they were just a token. It was just something It didn't really mean anything. It didn't have a tie to real world value. It was uh, sort of just like a gift card to use on a platform. But uh, things have changed significantly now, particularly, you know, in the DeFi space, the exchange coin space, you can see that they're tied to you know, the actual success of the underlying protocol, the underlying business, um, with those revenues flowing directly into the token, uh, you know, through generally a buy and burn model. And what that does is, you know, even in a really bearish market environment, for example, people are still going to be trading. There's still trade volume on exchanges that still generates fees, and that's still going to push the price of you know exchange coins up relative to others, uh, for example. BNB, uh, which has you know done extremely well uh, over the past year, so you can look to those kind of uh, maturation you know indicators in, in the market, uh, why things are changing uh, now, and it's really beneficial in the long run, I think, um, because people will be able to construct portfolios of crypto assets that aren't you know don't all necessarily go up and down at the same time which would be great yeah you know, if you have a, a steady gain over time instead of you know three years of a really bad time and three years of a really good time it would, it would be uh, more palatable for institutional investors so do you see that coming after this bull market you know after bitcoin's had its blow off top and ethereum blow up and they take do you see that kind of divergence happening and we there's more people in the space trading. This, I don't think this, you know, the the inevitable bear cycle that is coming. I don't think it'll be um, very long or as extreme as it used to be. Primarily because the institutions that buy, um, you know, many of them are buying for the long term. They're not going to fold, panic sell after twenty percent. You know, these guys have committed this capital. They say it's only three percent or five percent max of you know their hedge funds value um if it goes to zero it's not going to you know bankrupt them they're going to keep that and hold it uh, as a as a bet against inflation as a bet against quantitative easing in the long term 
So short-term price movements up and down 20, 30%, they're not going to, to sell. Institutions and the development of the derivatives and options markets, options in particular have grown massively over the past quarter or two, I think are going to bring about a lot more price stability in the future, particularly on the downside, because in 2017, it was a very retail driven cycle. Um, it was driven by you know guys on the street just buying mass buying Bitcoin. And then as it started to go down, everybody panicked and sold and tried to get out. Um, but institutions won't have that same kind of response in terms of panic buying at the top and then selling low. And it'll be a much smoother curve. You know, they're essentially just taking the Bitcoin, you know, that Bitcoin out of supply for a while. And their investment horizon isn't in months, it's in, in years. So uh, if they bought this year, you know, they probably wouldn't be looking to sell for three to five years. I mean, we could keep talking about this. And I think maybe this will be a good place to say we'll discuss this in future videos we do on the channel. We'll do like an update of Invictus and then get into that stuff. Because that's that's the real interesting stuff that you don't generally here out there in the overall crypto space it's kind of just like the day-to-day -day news but understanding it from a longer term perspective could really help ease the uh, the the emotions of the everyday retail investor as well ultimately what what does the most damage to people in terms of the cryptocurrency environment is feeling the need to get back into the market once you've secured a profit a lot of people get out and you know the price goes up a bit more um, and they feel like they have to get back in. And when they do, it's generally you know, near some sort of a top. And then once they've lost 20%, you know, then they'll feel like, okay, it's going to zero, I've got to get out. But those points of extreme emotion where you're feeling like it's gonna to go to zero or it's gonna to go to a million dollars today, um, that's generally how you can tell internally whether you know this is the top or bottom like the point of maximum fear is generally when the market turns around you know some good advice i got once from a very successful long-term trader is to buy when no one's buying and sell when no one's selling um, but we generally you know for for the average guy i wouldn't i would never recommend trying to actively trade and if you do i mean use a small percentage of your portfolio and make sure that you really understand what you're doing before you know trying to use leverage or anything like that because um, i have seen it destroy a lot of people's portfolios and a lot of people would have been more successful if they just held um, an index fund over the long term because if you're using even 2x 3x leverage there are a lot of flash crashes which can just completely wipe you out the best way to stay in this game long term it's just to hold the spot assets in an index fund the performance i mean you can compare it to some of the guys that are posting about their leverage trading gains on on twitter but i mean c20 for example in one year did about 800 percent particularly recently this quarter it's done really well a lot of the the altcoins that were rallying the lower half of the, the top 20 really buoyed you know the c20 fund as a whole even though bitcoin was dipping recently yeah. you know for example, like Doge, crazy gains, you've diversified into the other assets in the fund, uh, you know, after it spikes, you know, it gets rebalanced across the other assets um, so that, you know, we're not holding such a large percentage still in that currency. That's what I talk about often on the channel. It's for the majority of people, it's easy just to stick around for the bull, stick around for the bear, buy when no one else is buying, and then just ride it out. That's kind of, you're setting your position and ride it out. Because when I did... I looked at my results from 2017 when I first started in this space. It was would have been better just buying and holding Ethereum, you know, getting in at I can, 10 bucks or yeah, 15 bucks I mean, I, <laughs> and getting up to 1500, just buy and hold it. It's easy. Getting into trading um, is often a very expensive exercise in the beginning. You need to learn <laughs> it. You need to get into it. But even just doing major space. swings, major swings can usually help out. But yeah, the day to day stuff, it's easier with an index fund or just buy and hold something that has proven itself i think it's a good point to wrap up and touch base again next month seeing what's going on with the institutions with the uh with the fund itself and the overall cryptocurrency space if you're keen for that absolutely yeah. i have more than welcome to to field any questions uh, we're also available on discord pretty much online uh, 24 7 so if anybody has any questions uh, feel free to pop in and ask I'll leave the links down below for your Discord, for Twitter, 
and then the funds that we talked about in today's video as well. So yeah, I just want to say thank you once again, Daniel from Invictus. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, guys, if you enjoyed that, let us know, hit the like button. If you want to see more of it, subscribe to the channel, bell notification icon, but most importantly, like it up so we know that you're enjoying it and understanding a bit more behind the scenes about the cryptocurrency space. Thanks once again, mate. I'll catch you next time. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Too easy. Catch you later, guys.